I'm a management and programs analyst. I work in the national security community. I spent three and a half years um, as a contractor at DHS HQ. If you read the mainstream press, like they all have signal accounts, text them, leak everything you can. Making sure that we're naming what is happening as a coup. Totally agreed in the shutdown DC conversations that I've been having and that's not on the federal side. We um, also are often saying like, we'll call it a coup. Do we have any plans for how to respond if there's a coup? On the 5th, we're going to uh, shut down the White House. Map the White House and know every access point so we knew we could blockade it. On the 6th, we're going to shut down uh, larger parts of Washington, D.C. We've been working on a target map and a framework for scenario. So. Where are all the police stations? Where are all the key government buildings? Who are the Trump boosters? Members of Congress that are coming in, um, we're gonna meet them at the airports or at Union Station um, and send them back to where they came from until we deal with the, the situation that we're in. We are going to be in a crisis, but we want it to be one that we are creating. Whoever's got the guns can win. Let's take over the buildings. If there are people that are willing to do that, we should support them. Get ready to shut your city down on the 4th or the 5th. Regardless of who wins, the left plans to take over. Our undercover inside the Sunrise Movement was able to obtain exclusive video footage inside Zoom chats where Shutdown DC, BLM, and other leftist organizations are coordinating a multi-level coup action exercise utilizing insider help from Democrat Party members. That's what an abolitionist world looks like as well as federal employees and intelligence contractors. Let's talk about what actions and decisions are in your immediate sphere of influence as um, somebody who works in the government. I think making sure that we're naming what is happening as a coup in mm -hmm. every different language um, and communications with coworkers will be really important. Yeah. Um, totally agreed in the shutdown DC conversations that I've been having and that's not on the federal side. We um, also are often saying, like, call it a coup. It's a coup. Don't let anyone tell you it's not. The video you're about to see should concern every American, regardless of whatever their political affiliation is. What we've uncovered here has been vetted by high level analysts and seasoned journalists. Given the nature and sensitivity of this information, we have already sent it off to government officials and law enforcement authorities so that they can be ready and prepared for whatever happens next. Disruption. If you're on this call, you might be inclined to like that working group. Disruption is all about the smaller actions that can make up our movement. So they're about connecting people to affinity groups and then thinking through how do we take action to actually disrupt business as usual. Who's involved and to what extent, we don't know. But what we do know is that our insider inside the Sunrise Movement and other radical organizations was able to give us recordings of Zoom chat meetings involving shutdown DC. So-called peaceful protesters and outside agitators, including members of the Democrat Party, federal employees, and government contractors are coordinating street actions with intergovernmental involvement. Black Lives Matter, Shut Down DC, the Sunrise Movement, Antifa factions, and many, many more are involved. They call themselves affinity groups, and they coordinate their compartmentalized actions together. In one meeting, they are discussing and training for high-risk actions. I really want to hear from uh, Shut It Down DC about this. Um, do you ha do we have any plans for how to respond if there's a coup? Kiki Green, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter DMV DC, and a trainer with Momentum. In this Zoom chat, the leadership from several far-left organizations can be seen talking about their plans. Um, yeah, we, we uh, um, have been in 
uh, dis you know, discussion for a couple months about uh, how to respond to different contested election scenarios. First step is that we we think that we need to start the the post election phase in the streets. Helen, what's up? Yeah, we, we need you to stop talking now. Patrick Young is one of the main organizers for Shutdown DC, who participated in training sessions for the Sunrise Movement, where they, as the Wide Awakes, plan to protest outside Lindsey Graham's house. We are going to Senator Lindsey Graham's house um, at 6 a.m. We'll be there from 6 to 8 with Sunrise DC. Good morning, Lindsey Graham! We reported about this planned event prior to it happening by obtaining a recording of their training session. Our information was able to get law enforcement on the scene to keep the agitators from vandalizing and breaking into the senator's home. This is why when we received this footage and all the surrounding documentation and further investigation into the participants, we knew to take this serious. I heard someone in the chat talking about revolution time. Um, and so I encourage, you know, for all of us to be fighting for revolution before today, today, tomorrow, afterwards. In another meeting, they are scheduling their plan of action between election night and inauguration. So we're inviting people to come to BLM Plaza um, anytime after 4 p.m. on election night. And um, we're going to watch what's going on together. They reveal a massive and ambitious plan of taking over the White House, Washington, D.C. in general, and shutting down Congress. On the 5th, we're going to uh, shut down the White House. So let's say we want to shut down the White House and make sure nobody goes in and out, right? We would need to have map the White House and know every access point so we knew we could have blockade it. But then we would need more people to support that. So we might say Black Lives Matter Plaza and... Uh, the African American Museum on the Mall Constitution, a two public assembly site, so we can quickly move large numbers into zones of potential conflict. So we're talking about what would it take to surround the White House and have people do stuff. We can divide it up easily with affinity groups. On the 6th, we're going to shut down uh, larger parts of Washington, D.C. Congress is planning on coming to town and passing laws again and like having business as usual. And we're saying there's if, if we're in a coup, there's no time for business as usual. Is there a scenario that might play out that would cause us to all go and shut down an airport? Members of Congress that are coming in, um, we're gonna meet them at the airports or at Union Station um, and send them back to where they came from until we deal with the, the situation that we're in. We're gonna see potential fighting all over the country or in some hot spots, right? We've already seen that. And so how do we work together across the country to help support each other, no matter where we are, and to, to um, maximize our impact by doing similar things on similar days at similar time? We have to be willing to put our bodies on the line and take on some discomfort, sacrifice, risk in order to change things. So again, chaos is a soup by which change emerges. Let's get cooking. If there should be a coup, we should be clear, like, it's got to go. Trump's got to go. In order to achieve what they did, they knew they had to take over important government buildings. I think we don't have a lot of experience taking over government buildings. And we might need to think about that. And I know, as I, you know, I said earlier how, you know, we may find ourselves in the streets with people with different tactics than ours, but like, there may be some people that are willing to break the windows to get into the government buildings. Like, if that's what we need to do, then we shouldn't fight about that. Let's do that. Let's take over the buildings. War has got fighting. And then knowing that if some of the other folks emerge that are gonna fight back, that we need to stay out of their way. We might need to figure out in advance how to build some agreements and if there are people that are willing to put their body between the white militia and a bunch of people that are mobilized, I want to do nothing other than support them, have their back. You know, you can also stick, right? So this is like disabling vehicles, taking action against property, especially property that's designed to hurt us is violence. 
I think it's smart sometimes. I think spray painting cameras that are security cameras trying to track us could be smart. And I don't say this because I think that anyone of us wants to go out and get killed. I don't want to get killed. Nobody wants to get killed. Yeah. And so part of what we learn is like if, 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 if you're escalating and I escalate, we're going to go like this. Lisa Fithian is a National Steering Committee member of United for Peace and Justice, a coalition of over 1,000 local and national groups and member of the national team of Extinction Rebellion. I am someone that has had to sort of rethink my own orientation to nonviolence over the years because we're, we're, when we enter a moment where we are now where you have armed militia uh, that have shot and killed people that are threatening to arm up more guns have been sold in this country in the past period than lord knows how many where people use their cars to drive into people when i think about what 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 we may face i say to myself we are way out of our league and I've been in conversations where people have never thought about having a gun or like, should I have a gun? And I'm gonna talk a little bit in a few minutes about what do we do when guns are in the mix? Lisa Fithian is described by Mother Jones as the nation's best known protest consultant. Is it coming out of college? I worked with Abby Hoffman uh, in upstate New York, up on the St. Lawrence River, where I first started doing environmental work. She credits the Youth International Party organizer, Abby Hoffman, as a mentor. I could hold you off forever just by using uh, uh, theatrical techniques. And the press is wireistic, and they're going to eat that goddamn thing up. And you look in Time Magazine, man, and there it is. He was arrested and indicted for conspiracy to incite a riot at the 1968 Democrat convention as part of the agitation group known as the Chicago Eight. Understand that when we say we're going to go do something, like we're going to shut that down, we are setting in motion a chain of reaction where the state then begins to embolden itself and shut itself down. Again, that's what we saw in Seattle as well, right? So um, we have to understand that we are trying to get them to do certain things, and whether we shut it down or they shut it down, it doesn't matter as long as it's shut down. Her involvement in this training session indicates the level of sophisticated organization and seriousness behind this operation. There's another website that we're looking at uh, that maps critical infrastructure. Um, so again, I think to myself, if we're in a coup situation and, the, and we're under attack and under fire, how do we in the safest way possible start chipping away at the systems and infrastructure they need to maintain power. You know, some of the stuff that shutdown DC is doing, some of the ways we're thinking about this that could be replicated in cities across the country. We've been working on a target map and a framework for scenario. Um, and we used software car called uh, ArcGIS. If you have a um, university uh, affiliation um, or somebody in your group does, you can probably get this for free. Otherwise you can get it for not very much. Um, but what's cool about this is we're able to pull in other like other public data sets. So in the purple, we have all the military uh, um, properties uh, in, in DC. Um, and then uh, the nice folks from the, uh, the District of Columbia city, gov uh, city government um, have made available uh, transportation infrastructure maps and all sorts of other things. This map gives these organizations tools that can provide situational awareness, enabling users to make accurate, informed decisions based on current or planned activities, all accessible on their computers and phones. So we began to put together a list of things we want to know about in the city. So where are all the police stations? Because it's good to know where the police are. Where are all the key government buildings? Where are all the media outlets? Who are the Trump boosters? We may decide we need to talk with Trump boosters. So where are they? Lisa um, and some, some other folks came up with a great list of uh, the folks that we you know, might want to go have conversations with. And you know, we have them in categories. 
The list of names they are referring to is very interesting. There is a website that caught attention having names and home addresses of donors from both parties and independents. Let's say there's a narrow Trump victory. We might have to pivot. And at that point, we might need to say, we need to target the Democrats and make sure Biden does not concede. Or maybe it's a narrow Biden victory and Trump is not conceding. Maybe it's targeting Republicans and telling them it's time to get him to go, right? So we're thinking through the different scenarios and what might be the appropriate targets and then actions based on that so that people can start organizing and getting ahead of it. They even have a tactical map provided by Esri, which is used by NASA, NGA, USGS, FEMA, etc. With that information integrated into their interactive tactical map, they would have a common operations perspective for command and control of information and kinetic actions, a.k.a. a war. We're facing an administration and a potential coup and a potential insurrection where um, efforts to criminalize this are going to be even greater. Understanding that everything that we're doing now in this moment is laying the groundwork for what is going to come. Is there going to be a war? Are people going to get killed? Like, is that on anybody else's mind? I'm guessing it is. They have amassed relevant data from the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, the D.C. Hospital Association, Fire and Emergency Medical Services. When we zoom a little bit closer, um, we, we can take a look at, um, here, here's a version of it where in the, you know, we're seeing live traffic here um, and then where there are road closures. Geographic information, transportation, traffic, and infrastructure, spatial data systems, etc. And then if we go uh, even further in, um, we've got uh, super high resolution. This is once again um, uh, a uh, courtesy of the, the District of Columbia, super high resolution, better than on um, Google Maps, aerial photography of uh, Washington, D.C., we showed this map to experts in military information operations and counterterrorism, and they were very concerned that this group had this map. We may decide that we want to go talk to the media. Um, so where are they? We might have to like take over a TV station, right? Maybe we're taking over the local TV station and getting airtime to put out a call for people to come join us. I know that sounds crazy. I've always wanted to do it, though. So we're talking about what would it take to surround the White House and have people do stuff. We can divide it up easily with affinity groups. So I want to encourage people to think about who's got the power in your community, map the power, map the opportunities, then look at it strategically and begin thinking about who you would want to engage based on the scenario that's happening. So for us, that might mean looking at blocking the bridges and main thoroughfares coming into the city to kind of shut the city down. Are these people preparing for a war? Right now, a bunch of the folks that I work with, we're ordering gas masks. I know people that are buying Kevlar vests. Again, we didn't cause the war. We didn't ask for this war. Many of us are here because we want to fight it. We want something different. I have been in situations with live ammunition in more than one, one time. What are we willing to do? Right, because again, we're not dealing with people with just Simple guns, we're dealing with people with AR, you know, AK-47s, multiple rounds, a lot of shootings. So, um, yeah, we are going to be in a crisis, but we want it to be one that we are creating. We want to make sure that we are on the offense and not the defense. We want them to be responding to us and us not responding to them. Between her, Patrick Young, and the other organizations they are involved with, we should expect to witness a serious attempt to execute their plan. However, one must ask, what else could be at stake? This radical organization shut down DC, hosts a workshop for federal employees to utilize them in their official capacity to participate in their coup action plan. I've been a 
federal employee in a couple of different services uh, for about 28 years, and I work in the national security community. My name is Laura Adams, and I'm a member of Democracy Kitchen, one of the groups that's putting this uh, workshop together. I worked for about uh, four years for USAID. Laura Adams is currently Senior Director for Strategy, Development and Learning at Freedom House in Washington, D.C. and worked for USAID for almost three years in the Human Rights and Governance DRG sector in the formulation of USAID strategies, programs and training. Yes, thank you. Um... Laura and Maria, that was really excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. I, I have to say, as an attorney in the federal government, um, I, I am finding the chat uh, suggestions very interesting. And I just do want to remind people that we lose our status as federal employees if we strike. Sarah Starrett is currently a federal attorney for the U.S. Department of Labor and has been for nearly 13 years. What does it look like in practical terms to put you know, uh, to slow the gears down in some ways or another. At, at, at the Department of Labor, it, it takes the form of um, several rounds of the cost benefit analysis for a new regulation. And when um, when the numbers were, when people were cheating on the numbers, uh, a copy of that draft got leaked uh, to the data labor report and it got published and it got sent to a congressperson. And the Office of Inspector General opened an investigation on who was cheating on the numbers. Um, so again, that's sort of a combination of tactics. It's, it's, it's making a really good paper trail. It's making sure that that document got out to someone who could make use of it. And then Congress getting the Office of Inspector General involved. It's, it was really a way to stop that thing just in its tracks. And it, it worked really well. Federal employee myself, really happy to bring this here. We will be dropping links in the chat for the federal guide that you can refer to for more information after this workshop is over and please do share that widely. That makes this medium incredibly subversive. Nadine Block, who worked with the Direct Action Network and Ruckus Society, partners with affinity groups associated with Momentum, the organization behind Black Lives Matter and the Sunrise Movement. But whether or not you do a misdemeanor or an infraction on federal property or on public property um, really doesn't affect uh, most of the jobs uh, that you would be considered for, just, just as a sideline note. Yeah, uh, okay. as an attorney, I think I'm a, we, we're highly, uh, you know, that's one of the things we have to be careful about. My name is Laura. I am also a, um, a federal contractor rather than a federal employee. I spent three and a half years um, as a contractor at DHS HQ. My name is Maddie Salzman. Um, I'm a management and programs analyst uh, in a federal agency. Madeline Salzman has been a project manager at the U.S. Department of Energy for more than five years. We're in roles of power. We set and enforce rules. We hold people accountable to social norms. I um, have worked in the U.S. government. I worked in the State Department for over five years. Maria J. Steffen worked at the Department of Defense Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations and at NATO headquarters. Um, and I'm currently now on a leave of absence uh, from my job to focus on our domestic uh, democracy and peace building work. So I'm going to be bringing to bear perspectives both as an ac academic um, and as someone who has served um, as a public servant in U.S. government. Co-author of Why Civil Resistance Works, part of Columbia University's studies in terrorism and irregular warfare. She was also doing what appears to be military information support operations for Kiev Post, a publication everyone thinks is a CIA newspaper, during the U.S.-backed uprising in Ukraine. She is also a former senior fellow for the Atlantic Council as an expert on Ukraine and the logic of civil resistance. Rallies, marches, methods of non-cooperation. If anyone here is an expert on irregular warfare and mobilizing resistance movements, Stefan is.
Really, it's about how you all as uh, federal workers can be the penultimate public servant at a time when our country needs you the most. President Harry S. Truman famously said, I thought I was the president, but when it comes to these bureaucrats, I can't do a damn thing. There are definitely a lot of different go slow tactics. And I think, you know, um, this is also an area where, um, you know, folks on the outside, so private citizens, those um, in groups on the outside, being able to show uh, solidarity with federal workers and, and um, you know, civil servants is particularly important during this moment. Bureaucracy is a really powerful pillar. And, you know, federal workers have unparalleled familiarity with the bureaucratic process. They know how to speed things up. They know how to slow them down. They have access to critical information about policies that are being considered and implemented. They can participate in an internal decision making. They can provide or deny knowledge and expertise that those um, at the top of the bureaucratic uh, totem pole need. And another act of commission, albeit highly um, you know, risky, and there are a number of um, uh, great downsides, is leaking. So leaking information about pen or actual policies with journalists, with activists, influential people on the outside. Um, but this, you know, really uh, should be used very judiciously only on truly significant matters um, because most disclosures outside of formal internal whistleblowing are at minimum a violation of contractual duty and they may put leakers um, at significant legal risk. Uh, connecting with civic groups and organizations on the outside and having frank and honest conversations with them. And when you think about it, the legal support and advocacy work of civil society organizations could come in really in handy, um, you know, if and when you have to take certain actions on the inside. And I will pass it to uh, Comrade Locke. This alleged federal employee admits to leaking government information to the media and encourages others to do so as well. I'm a federal employee for almost five years now. I just recommend everyone who works in the federal government, if you read the mainstream press, like who is covering your agency, who is working for ProPublica, who is working for Politico, um, they all have signal accounts. Text them, leak everything you can, save your emails, record. I record these meetings, I send it over. I, and I can't believe I'm showing my face here but I've been doing this for months. And if you do have to write something, write something with really crappy, you know, just unintelligible, ungrammatical language to just make them look terrible. And it will look like something that comes from this administration anyway. But the journalists I've dealt with have been super ethical in ways to shield me. Okay. Meaning to be the source of the leaks. He even claims that he will be part of Biden's transition team if Biden wins. If there's a Biden win next week, um, there's going to be a transition team coming in. And uh, I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time working with them. Some would argue that these people represent the fringe and are not to be taken serious. However, when you see the caliber of leadership, organization, tactical operations capabilities, and military intelligence experts all working together in unison, this has the ingredients to overthrow an elected government and install a puppet regime, a parallel government that they have ready in waiting. Say you have two narratives happening simultaneously. There's the existing Trump appointees saying there is no transition team because there's no transition, it's a continuation. Then you have Trump side or Biden side saying, um, I won and my team is coming to the doors. We How can do make those determinations ourselves. We, you know, they say you're gonna use your email <laughs> account and we're gonna start and we're yeah. like, I don't know, we're like the Lithuanian government in exile or something. We're gonna that we're gonna start working with them. They make it clear that if they can get enough federal employees to go along with their plans, they can choose who takes control of the government by simply doing the bidding of the usurpation of power on behalf of the Biden campaign. We we get to choose who the leader is, um, and I don't know what risk that puts on you and. and 
I'm not a fed again, so I don't want to like put you in a weird situation. But like, I think that is a point where you and your team and your supervisors and those um, non-appointee, like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what's the, the term? Uh, career career staff can actually decide like, well, according to our understanding, Biden won and therefore we are listening to his appointees and his transition team. Um, and that's obviously going to be on your uh, your thoughts there. Even Lisa Fithian makes it clear that these groups all work together. Inside government, outside government, the more radical and the more moderate. So many of the institutions, the nonprofits, the community-based organizations, the labor unions, um, are all see themselves as part of that Democratic Party machine. They all work on a hierarchical model but I want to always make sure that we're working intentionally inside and outside, because again, it's very easy for the people on the inside to, um, to throw away the people on the outside, to use them, but then to cut the deals. Through a delicate balance of brokering deals over who gets what power. How are we always in right relationship? And how are we, especially those of us that are white, or those of us that have power in institutions or labor, how are we not continuing to center ourselves, but using our energies as accomplices to support the voices of the people who are on the front lines right now? I'm very nervous um, because I'm in the high risk group for resisting arrest. Two minors are going to get arrested. Their parents will be in D.C. Our lawyer is down to support. The middle group got arrested and the two side groups didn't because the two side groups when the cops came by and said, you can't do this, they said, okay, so sorry, pulled up the banners. The top group said, no, we're staying. And so they just stayed. And it's like, if they had said, oh, so sorry, they wouldn't have gotten arrested. You turn people on the streets and confront the whole city because we can, young people in Boston, can shut down the whole city. If I have a thousand young people, I can shut down four or five highways and this city is in shackles. That's just the truth. Because momentum has been like foundational for us at Sunrise. So no big deal, you know, just realized we needed to take over the entire United States <laughs> and all the institutions in it. Um, so uh, I'm gonna fast forward to when Sunrise launched. We're talking about some pretty intense things. How do we open up the doors to everyone, but also keep each other safe? If you're gonna do something that's super high risk, don't talk to anybody about it. Don't put it on the phone. Don't put it on the emails. Don't put it in the text. It's face to face. You do it. You don't have to tell anybody. Don't because we don't know who anybody is. The peaceful transition of power is crucial to the framework of our government, and they plan to disrupt that by taking advantage of a close or even contested election as a trigger point to inject the radical progressive policies by physically taking over the government. Not just Washington, D.C., but actions will be led all across the United States, starting on election night through Inauguration Day. Despite these revelations, we still don't fully know the entirety of their plans. Over the next 48 hours, we will be releasing a treasure trove of documents, images, and video files from inside the Sunrise Movement and other related affinity leftist groups. You can find these materials at exposesunrise.com and sunriseexposed.com. Spreadsheets, internal documents, training manuals, PDFs spelling out their plans, images, and exclusive never-before-seen Zoom video chats. And you never know what new content might be populated on these websites, because we still have insiders within the Sunrise Movement and their affinity groups. You can support independent journalism by going to millennialmillie.com and making a purchase or giving a donation. We now have brand new limited edition Shadowgate hats. We have both pink and black. You can find them exclusively at millennialmillie.com. So get them while they last. We also have stickers, t-shirts, and signed posters. Your purchases support real journalism.